Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Kate Meenan Law, and I'm on the board of Solus Nua, and I want to welcome you to this evening's Solus Nua SIF at Home and NYU DC Dialogues presentation. Tonight, we have a special treat listening into a conversation between Jackie Hoisted and Rusbek Washidi, the director of this month's featured film, Phantom Islands. We hope you enjoyed watching the film at your own pace and in your own time. And of course, if you have not yet, please do view the film after tonight's discussion. And please be generous in your support of this non-funded program and click the donate button so that we can continue to support the artists and producers involved in these films. And do check out our website, solosnewa.org for all the current and upcoming programming. Sean will put some of these links into the chat. Um, pay some particular attention to our upcoming online Prime Cut Festival um, this is a theater company in Belfast that we will be featuring um, for the second half of the month here in November. I do want to thank Tom McIntyre, Holly Theresian, and everyone at NYU for making this event possible. And as always, a thank you to Solus Newest, Sean Wren, for putting it all together. So let me introduce our panelists. Rosbo Rashidi, an Ar Iranian Irish filmmaker, was born in Tehran. He has been making films since the year 2000 when he founded the Experimental Film Society in Tehran. As is evident in Phantom Islands, he roots his cinematic style in a poetic interaction of image and sound. His work is deeply engaged with film history and primarily concerned with mysticism, philosophy, esotericism, cosmology, phenomenology, and hauntology. His films often induce a dreamlike experience when watching them. The films are wildly experimental and often surrealist, magic realist and mysterious and have been associated with the remodernist movement. In discussion with Rosebeth tonight is Jackie Hoisted, a longtime friend of Solus Nua and former board member. For many years, she was the driving force behind our visual arts programming and Solus Nua has had the privilege of featuring many of her works in her curated exhibitions. Jackie was born in Dublin, but is now based in Montgomery County Maryland and is an award-winning interdisciplinary artist, curator, and activist. Her solo exhibitions have been staged across the US and her work has been featured in the Washington Post, Washington City Paper, Huffington Post, the Pittsburgh Tribune Review, and the Reno Gazette Journal. She is co-founder of ArtWatch, a DC artist collective focused on positive political activism that realized the One House Project in the years 2017 and 18. This was a collaboration of 300 district, Maryland and Virginia artists standing up for equality and inclusion. So please join me in welcoming both Jackie, who is joining us from Montgomery County, Maryland, and Rospa, who is currently in Berlin, but lives in Dublin. So again, welcome both Jackie and Rospa. Thank you. thank you so much, Kate. Uh, Ruzve, I want to say thank you for joining us tonight and it's a pleasure for me to have this opportunity to have a chat with you and to find out more about your work and yourself. So I thought we would begin with uh, a conversation like of uh, where you came from. I know you're Iranian and that you're now living in Dublin and how did that come about? Sure. Well, thank you so much. First of all, I would like to thank um, NYU and uh, Solus Snow and Sean and Kate and for giving me this opportunity and this very kind of unique platform and also way of distributing um, such films, which I found it quite fascinating. And it kind of differs from other ways of uh, kind of uh, showing these films. So I, I really want to thank for this opportunity. Yes, so I was born in Iran in 1980. I have lived in Iran, Tehran for the first 23rd year of my life. And after that, because of a very kind of usual, it's a very usual thing for Iranians after the Iranian revolution to kind of uh, immigrate. And my family uh, from my father's side first, they moved to UK and then my father moved to UK, but it was Kelki Kel Tiger and it was kind of, um, Ireland was booming and everyone was telling my father, perhaps we should try Ireland. And he went to Ireland, he loved it, especially because of the very welcoming and very kind of generous uh, kind of uh, friendships that he was able to form in, in Ireland. So in the beginning of uh, 2000, he moved to Ireland and he was 
kind of working there and living there and then he kind of invited us to join him and me and my mother and my little brother we joined him and immediately I just felt the same and I started to do what I have been doing back home in Tehran, Iran to kind of develop this type of film practice that I was develop developing and making but I found it quite fascinating because I felt that okay this is Europe this is uh, the land of uh, and kind of progress and everything but to my surprise when I came to Ireland uh, this uh, cultural side of uh, experimental cinema wasn't that much uh, welcomed and kind of um, embraced by the kind of the film industry so I, I immediately started to work on film collective that I have formed in the year 2000 in Tehran called Experimental Film Society. And through the Experimental Film Society, I was able to find and locate like-minded people. And I tried to kind of uh, work with them systematically over the number of years and archive their films and produce their films and also distribute their films. So somehow uh, this transition, um, this kind of immigration process was uh, for me, it was a very uh, kind of uh, useful and beneficial and fruitful um, uh, journey. And do you mind me asking you, what age were you when you came from Iran to, to Ireland? Of course, no problem. I was 23 years old when I first moved to Ireland. And the first uh, few years, I was kind of doing a little bit of studying and improving my English and also kind of studying what uh, kind of cinematic culture of Ireland is and because I'm very much interested in uh, kind of uh, cinephilia and understanding what what has been done in the past so I was kind of studying what was going on and kind of networking and looking at people's work uh, and so that was kind of at the beginning and then beginning later on it has progressed through progress. different stages. Right, so you're already practicing your art practice of filmmaking before you came, um, before you came to Ireland, and uh, but, but I read somewhere I think that you had gone to you went you went to university in Ireland. You went to the Dublin Institute of Technology. Did yes. you study filmmaking there? Yes, I went to DIT and I studied media arts. Uh, but that wasn't the course that I was really looking for because I it was very much about. Um, film industry and it was really uh, about jobs finding jobs where you know I was have from the very beginning I always knew that I'm not a director I'm a filmmaker and I really want, want to kind of distinguish between these two terms director is someone who has a job and can technically execute anything that is related to the between the script and between the and the the, the, the production a side of a filmmaking and it's it's a wonderful thing it's a, it's a beautiful thing but filmmaker it's it's i perhaps perhaps this is my definition it's someone who has a certain concern certain philosophical or artistic concern and use as the medium and based on his or her um, practice to express a cer certain things so I always knew that I'm a filmmaker. I have certain concern about cinema. I want to have certain obsession with moving images, with, within sounds, between the history of cinema and within history of myself. And I kind of put them together and I created a very strange compound and kind of been experimenting on this formula, uh, almost like an alchemist, you know? You try to kind of turn water into wine. It never, you, you never reach to that point but this kind of this process this this engagement with the material this constant engagement engagement with the material is really the key and when i started to make films i really didn't want to become an experimental filmmaker really that's that's not something that i have chosen from the beginning uh, cautiously you know uh, it somehow i I started to make film, then I realized that, okay, this is not documentary. Okay, this is not conventional narrative. This is not um, artist uh, moving image. So the ex experimental genre was the closest thing that I could find and somehow go under it as a, some sort of a banner, as a, some sort of an umbrella. Even to this day, I don't, not quite exactly sure what experimental cinema is. 
And I think right. the moment I would know what experimental cinema is, I would stop making films. Because the reason I'm making this is just to find out what is this experimentation. I'm very engaged with the process. So, so I come from, uh, you know, the visual arts uh, background. So, so for us, we would have video art, right? Mm -hmm. So, and it's very hard to describe exactly what that can be because, again, it's it's the medium, it's the film, it's the filmmaking that's the art material. So, and I feel like that's almost the same as in in your case, the experimental uh, film. But do you distinguish between the two? That's a very good question. That's a very important factor. Um, the key is to go back to, to, this, to this, its history, to, to its um, specification. I mean, I have realized that throughout the years, there is not a single, there is not, there is no, there is no um, guidebook. There is no something that you would go to, like a Bible. You, you, you go to it and you, you would say, okay, this is experimental cinema. This is this, this is that. It's a very, very... Um, um, what's the word? It's a very kind of problematic area, I think, to to put 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 your finger and you say this is this this genre is this and, and nothing else. You have a certain classics in experimental experimental genre, like any other genre. You can refer to them and you can study them, and you would get a sense of what has been done before you. And these uh, works would always kind of um, kind of um, they would feed into your current uh, practice even without you completely knowing them even without you completely understanding them where where, where did they come from but in my case uh, for me as i said um, this series of experimentations um, was never aligned with video arts was never aligned with um, with visual arts, because the spaces that I was very interested in to present my work were very much uh, kind of cinematic spaces, like, like you would have a, a conventional cinema. And for me, it was very much important that the film would start from a certain time and end from a certain time. Whereas video art doesn't necessarily have that. It's like a, a loop that you would go and you engage with it. And the life, that kind of attention span of an audience in a gallery uh, based on some statistics is just less than 30 seconds. So because they don't give us chairs to sit yeah, on. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So you would have to kind of produce work specifically with, with, with these conditions. I have produced work for galleries and that's absolutely fine. And that's something I would love. But for me, this beginning, this chunk of time, this, 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 this mosaic of time as Tarkovsky calls it, that you would go and you engage with it through this duration, through this uh, a pressure of time for me was very much important. And I needed this, this kind of block of time to, to express my ideas. At the same time, this is just me. That doesn't mean this is cinema. Cinema doesn't even have to be in space. You would have performative, uh, you would have something called expanded cinema or para cinema that you would incorporate elements of cinema and you would bring certain performance and you would reveal the mechanics of cinema and you would show the projector you would kind of you would kind of demystify the, the whole process of and this is also cinema so it's a very very complex mutating ever growing ever changing um, phenomena and we only know cinema for the past 130 35 years but you would you would you can go back and you, you would see magic lantern shows. You would see um, the kind of pre-devices of cinema, such as zoetrope or praxinoscope. These are all heavily um, um, cinematic kinetics experiences. So I have always tried to kind of embrace and kind of invite them into my work and, and questioning the audience, what is cinema? How are we engaging with cinema? What is the means of cinema? There is always a question. I have never, I don't think over the past 22 years with any of my films have provided or could provide any answers. I have always posed questions and hope that audience would, uh, would somehow come up with some form of an answer themselves. So, so you're asking the audience to, to determine what, what experimental film is or to determine what's the end, like what was the meaning of your films? 
I, 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 I'm asking what actually, what I'm asking is actually far more important, I think, in my view, uh, than experimental cinema. I'm asking what is cinema actually? Because in the end, genre, it's only a label that you would hint audience what kind of films they're going to watch based on the a, 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 a capital that they are investing or time that. So it's a really a marketing strategy. And we need uh, uh, genres, we need these labels. But at the same time, if you kind of look at it, you're, you're engaging with cinema itself. It's a medium of cinema. Nevertheless, you're, if, you, if, you watch, if you're kind of looking at a Salvador Dali painting or you're looking at a, a, a Goya painting, of course, they belong to a different era, different category, different genre. But at the same time, it's a medium of painting. Um, right. It's the same. It's the same with cinema. Um, you, you kind of uh, when when we see when we tell audience, okay, this is experimental cinema. Perhaps we are hinting, we are kind of suggesting this is something a little bit unconventional. This is something unorthodox. This is something non-standard. So they would be ready for that. What I'm hoping to do or achieve with my films is to kind of um, to some sort of co-creation with audience. I have I am providing some form of a bass, uh, some form of a drum, but I'm hoping the audience would put their own melody on top of what I am creating on top of and then together we would have a, a, a fully finished song or even half finished. It's really a kind of um, experiential sensory process and you would kind of conjure up a, a type of energy. And what audience can, would do with this energy, it's really up to them. As much as the film is about me, it is about themselves, the audience too. It's really not, a, um, it's not really an Alfred Hitchcock film that you would follow a narrative, which I'm deep, I'm, I'm, I love Hitchcock so much, but I'm not, I'm not even able to, capable of making such film. You would follow this, um, this, this linear narrative and you're kind of um, tolerating or kind of experiencing some form of a, a suspense and you would want to kind of um, kind of open up the enigma and then when you reach the resolution and you get the reward at the end. This type of film that I'm making is very unknown. It's like uncharted territories. You would, you have to, as if you're lost in some sort of a forest or a, a desert or a wilderness without map or compass. Some audience will never, will never get out of this experience and perhaps they would hate the film. But nevertheless, there is something going on. And some, some people would find a way to come out of that experience and look at it from a different angle. So it's a very risky business. It's a very, um, you would always risk, you would always pose question, you would always somehow push the audience into very on in, into void and they have to come up. It's always challenging, really challenging experience for the audience. Well, uh, well, I think like to, to bring in Phantom Islands, for example, mm -hmm. there's no dialogue there. Mm -hmm. And I personally feel that it's it's a challenge to me because there's no dialogue. So much has been left to me as the viewer to decide what the story is about, to inject what's happening in my own mind, what's happening along the way. And even at the end, you're not quite sure what, what really has happened or even has it even ended when it did end. Uh, so, uh, and is that purposeful in, in your mind when you, you know, plan out the movie? These are very, very beautiful uh, comments. Thank you. I'm really glad you're mentioning this. Yes, um, well, as in terms of dialogue, we have to remember that um, the first um, 30, 35 years of cinema, we were dealing with silent cinema. And that has um, impacted my work and my career um, tremendously. So cinema actually really has started as some form of an extreme experimentation, as some form of a, an, an, an audiovisual medium and that you could express very interesting things. In fact, if you look back at the early days of cinema, those films are not some form of a, uh, abomination that people that didn't know what they were doing. In fact, they were really tapping and they were kind of experimenting with this medium to a very extreme creative levels. But soon after this medium have been, as everything else, have been commercialized 
and the format of feature film that we know these days, it's really a product of that. Because those, if you, if you read the book from the beginning and uh, to the end continuously, you would somehow reach to this duration. So it's a really um, kind of uh, has an economical side to it as well, that why cinema it is now. Uh, as we know it. But at the beginning, uh, people and directors and filmmakers were, were really experimenting with these methods, with these techniques to kind of, to, to convey a feeling, to convey um, a very unique um, um, experience or sensorial experience with cinema. So I really wanted to kind of make a silent film, but in modern era. And I didn't want to use a dialogue or language um, as we know it, as if these two, they have a very kind of clownish uh, kind of caricature and uh, very over the top exaggerated theatrical performances. So that could be really linked back to the early, early days of cinema. At the same time, those early days of cinema, they, they were usually shot on a type of like a tableau based type of um, shooting. So you would, because of this very heavy machinery of this kind of big machinery. They would put this camera uh, on, on this kind of massive tripod and they would kind of choreograph the scene and something were going on and people were going and coming and going. And I wanted to kind of also experiment with that. So I kind of put my camera in, in, on a tripod and I kind of, I didn't uh, move the camera. So, so it had this kind of tableau, very heavy type of uh, kind of, it's almost like a painting, but figures and, landscape are mo uh, moving and and you kind of all this questioning is it the landscape is it what what is the difference when you shoot a landscape which doesn't you have human quality and when you shoot uh, these people where does it come from that one of them becomes fiction the other one becomes documentary how do we draw this line i really want to kind of when we shoot landscape is it a documentary or is it a fiction so it's that's that's con it's, cinema has this kind of a, a very ex extreme binary, um, conflictuous, uh, complex side to it. The moment you, sh you shoot something, it, ha it has a kind of documentary quality, but it has an extreme fictitious also quality as well. So I want to kind of play with that. At the same time, I wanted to um, touch upon uh, the idea of landscape in Ireland, which has a very unique landscape. And I sh it's worth mentioning that I shot the film on 13 different little islands around Ireland over the course of one year. Because these places, uh, I, I, I come from a land of a, a kind of deserts and dry lands and very different uh, landscape. And when I was kind of entering this landscape, for me, it was a very alien-like uh, quality. And I wanted to kind of go back to those experiences that I would see this landscape for the first time. And also these people who, who are some form of a, like a tourist, um, and they're coming and seeing these things and constantly taking pictures. They're also like uh, aliens. You're kind of, um, kind of seeing and experiencing this very extremely haunting landscape, like an alien. You don't know what it is. And I wanted to kind of also... Um, be somehow um, create a this kind of, as if this this film is made for like a, a POV of an alien. You know, you don't know exactly. You, you don't have the grammar to fully understand the landscape. You don't have a, a knowledge to fully understand what people are saying. You don't um, have a a full grasp of what is happening. You see things. You see like you tune into this a kind of very strange aura. And it kind of touches the, uh, the the idea of immigration for me as well. And when I when I was moving to this place, to Thailand, for me it really felt like this. So in one way, um, I'm somehow dealing with ideas that I have uh, I wanted to express, but at the same time they are very very kind of aligned and attuned with my own personal experience of what immigration is. But I'm not one of those filmmakers who would kind of. Um, I'm not a literal filmmaker, I'm a, I'm a lyrical filmmaker. If something happens to me as a personal experience, for me, it doesn't make sense to 
illustrate that because I don't believe in illustration. I believe in, in being things, in being in the moment, like a kind of a, this poetical interaction for me is far more important. So, so that brings me, it brings me back to the original where you start off talking about the role of the director as opposed to mm -hmm. being a filmmaker and how you approach your, your art practice. So a, a director would have a script and he has a beginning and end, middle and, mm -hmm. and so forth. How do you approach planning your movie out in advance uh, or does it evolve along the way or how do, how do you approach that? Exactly. Yes, I mean, um, I was watching... Uh, 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 an interview with Luis Bonoel, the, the great Spanish filmmaker, and and he, someone asked him a similar question, and he would say, "I ha have no idea. I, I, I have zero idea. I always start, and this process always leads me to somewhere, and I'm like a kind of a medium, so the film passes through me. But I'm open to things. I'm open to life, and op I'm open to events in life, and open to the madness." of the filming of inside the location. I'm open to um, um, things that would happen um, during the kind of the, the process of creativity. For me, it's the same. It's, for me, it's almost like a gardening. You plant a seed. I have a very vague idea that I want to say. Of course, you have to convince uh, the founders that you have a very concrete idea. But um, in reality, I, I really don't. Um, I, I know very roughly, very vaguely what I want to do. So I plant that seed of creativity somewhere in my location, in my craft, in my camera, in my type of lens. I start somewhere and it grows and I grow with the film. So this kind of this plant slowly grows. What I can do as a creator or as a filmmaker is to mind the film like a, a child that is growing. Have to take care of but it has a, a, a life of its own it, ha it has a mind of its own i really believe that filmmaking and films they have a conscious of their own it might be sound a little bit um, um like a superstitious type of or kind of some kind of spiritual belief but for me it's really not for me it's really a practical I, I i as soon as i start to make films i see that this thing this entity has a life of, of, of its own. So what I what I do is I try to always enhance my craft, the way I work with the lenses, with the camera. And I, I really believe in the craft, almost like a Chinese potter who would make one pottery thousand times over and over again. But each time you would enhance it, you would kind of perfect it a little bit more. You never reach the perfection. But with this craft, you can, con to a certain degree, you can control the film. You can control the, the process of creativity. So until the very last day of editing, I have no clue what's going on. I was on. going to ask you that. Yeah. Zero. Really. I have, I, it has to be very honest. I'm, I'm very honest about, um, I really don't believe in, in, telo, in kind of intellectual um, mannerism of filmmaking. For me, it's a very visceral experience, really. For me, it's, it's really about kind of, talking and working with the actors in a very kind of body to body in a kind of a very kind of close relationship working with my um with the equipments i have with the optics for example in phantom island i used series of lenses um uh, in uh, that were uh, built in 19th century and i kind of somehow revamped and kind of recustomized these uh, lenses and i put them inside the 4K camera, which is a very new technology. So combining the very old and new technology, I could do that. It's something very technical you would do, but out, out of this sheer technical uh, cold environment comes a very uh, kind of poetic quality. And that's very interesting. So for, it's really finding this balance between uh, these, two, uh, these two places, these two uh, mindsets, these two, uh, uh, art practice so that's correct i don't have a script but at the same time the script the script is somehow written in on the wind i have to follow it and i have to kind of see it it's like you're not there is a script but it's not in form of a language the script it's somehow invisible but with your film you could somehow envision that and by the time you've finished the film and the script is almost one and they become a reality that audience can see it 
Right, but but in pantomime, you would have done some post editing with like there's uh, some scenes where there's a fish you can see it's a different resolutions, different. Yes, uh, yes, yes. So they all take place and, and there's conscious decisions made made in that along the way. Absolutely. For me, um, shooting um, and editing is a completely different process. For me, when I shoot the material, it's almost like going to an army or military service. I have to do these things to bring material back to editing. Editing for me is the most beautiful part of filmmaking. And in fact, the most creative part. Because uh, with, edit, with shooting, you gather material, you kind of go and kind of look for material, you kind of gather them, you kind of put them aside and slowly accumulate this material. But in editing, that's where the magic happens. You put element A for, from element B together and you kind of create a new compound. And it is really this uh, magical formula that's happening in editing. I follow that. There is a certain energy each time I um, edit my film that always guides me uh, through this uh, very unknown, um, uh, somehow uh, unknown narrative, unknown fragmented narrative. You, it's also worth mentioning that you always have a, a degree of narrative in any art, in anything. It's impossible, in fact, to have non-narrative. It's really, I, I believe that's impossible because you're always progressing. There is always a progression. It, it might not be a linear narrative or conventional narrative, but at the same time, it is some form of a, a narrative. An audience can sense that, can fill in the gap. Can, and that's why I'm saying that um, when this when this type of uh, kind of like a, uh, I sometimes call my films the monster, monster of Frankenstein, this kind of a strange uh, entity that I created, when audience would inhabit the film, they really transcend the film. They really kind of even enhance the film and they can bring more qualities to it. So I'm ho really hoping, I'm really banking on the intellect of the audience as well. You know, because the job of an artist is not to make something for the audience and decide for them, but hoping, but, in, but kind of gifting them something that be useful to them and they would somehow work with it. And as soon as I really believe that the, the real film really start when the audience would finish the viewing experience, the real film starts in their mind after the film, after they watch, uh, they, they finish the film. When you watch the Hollywood film, all the hustle and bustle and all this kind of drama and madness and everything is inside those moments that you're inside the cinema, this kind of car chase and whatever. And it's very thrilling. It's almost like a roller coaster ride. It's fantastic. I also enjoy it. I have nothing against Hollywood. But as soon as you leave the cinema, that experience ends. I am the opposite. For me, it might not be something very extraordinary happening during the film or kind of it's not a hustle and bustle and roller coaster but audience i'm hoping that they would think and they would go back to these moments that they have watched the film and the kind of analyze or the kind of um, try to extract um, something from the film after it's almost like an excavation you are kind of dealing with artifacts that has happened to you you're kind of dealing and digging and see this thing coming up for them and they use it yeah, I certainly felt that way, that there was like lots of open questions at the end and what was your intention and what was I supposed to think? And I keep rethinking about what I what what I should think and what conclusions, or if any, I should reach at all. So, but, exactly. so moving on from, from Phantom Island. So um, how did COVID impact your work and your practice? And what are you what are you working on now? Yes, COVID um, unfortunately has had a very um, extremely, I think as of all of us, like all of us, it has a very tremendously negative impact on the life of an artist, first and foremost, because of financial reasons, all of our gigs have been cancelled and screenings. And to be honest, it was a very grim, dark, bleak um, um, uh, type of beginning and kind of a year, perhaps 2020. But at some stage, you would somehow, when something like this happens, all of us try to reinvent ourselves in, in, in new ways and reimagine what we can do. So, I mean, there are loads of kind of remote type of filmmakings and collaborations and new ways of expressing your, yourself have happened. 
which is great. And also there are a lot of online screenings and new ways of uh, distributing films have happened. Although at the same time, I really believe in kind of this, this, this physical and this kind of being space and experiencing art and space. I'm so I'm very, very extremely glad that things are, some, there is no normal. I mean, there's always a new normal as we know it. But this kind of new things are happening that we can go and back to the spaces and galleries and museum to watch things. But what I did in, 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 in during the lockdown and pandemic, I kind of uh, planned and kind of strategize my next moves for my next film. So I had loads of time to kind of gather material, what I want to do, what I don't want to do. Uh, and it's, it's also very important that what I just, there was this very kind of frantic pace, I think that we were going at least myself before pandemic that somehow with this as if you kind of knocked from a horse and you somehow you're on this kind of you had this concussion and you don't know what but at, in this moment you think about your future and your past and the stuff that you really you don't want to go back to so i kind of i reduced many things i kind of eliminated some things that i don't want to go back i think that for me is far more important that i want to do now there are many things that I don't want to. There are many things that I don't want to go back to that to that mindset, to that to that kind of perhaps even unhealthy uh, way of living and producing art or whatever. So now I'm working on my next film, which is deeply actually impacted by the pandemic. It's a, a film, uh, unlike Phantom Island or unlike my other films, has much more slower rhythm it has a kind of very very great uh, kind of meditation type of quality it has a very therapeutic type of quality because in the end art uh, has a very kind of a therapeutic it's almost like a therapy for an artist isn't it and also for an audience and um, so it's a very kind of um, it's really about peace and kind of understanding and observing the world around you and it's a different, I, I, I can't call it a mature or kind of a type of filmmaking, but it's a different type of, it's, it's a new me, basically. So I had, I had time to reinvent myself, but I needed this time to, to reimagine. You know, Chris Marker talks about this in, in a very fantastic, it's very important to, to, um, to imagine the reality rather than experience the reality. You know, you, we, are, we are always experiencing the reality in a very kind of, a very close hybrid uh, form of um, human consciousness. But at the same time, it's also important to imagine, imagining yourself, where I am now, you know, what I'm doing now, just imagination rather than this factual grasp of it. So I had time to kind of think about this, these things. Very good. Yeah, I, I think actually it might be more, more productive to actually imagine rea reality than to actually experience it because it's so it's the minutia you experience and not the whole thing, I think. So, exactly. Yeah. So unfortunately, I think we have to leave it there. Um, I have so many more questions I would love to ask you, but we're out of time. But I want to thank you so much for joining us and uh, so you for hosting you and NYU as well. And for our audience members, there is um, a survey in the chat. If you could go to there from Solis Nua, if you could complete that, we would really, really appreciate that for some feedback. And with that, I'm going to say good night and thank you once again. Thanks a million. Thanks to all of you. Much appreciated and to the audience. Okay.